So shall I welcome everyone to uh, the webinar? This is actually the clinical updates in COVID-19. Uh, thanks to CRC, we are now, uh, uh, what do you call it, joined into this uh, clinical updates by several eminent uh, panelists. And the topic for today's discussion would be managing COVID-19 in pediatrics and pregnant ladies. To start off the agenda, the first speaker would be uh, Dr. Nora Shikin, um, Mama Fuan. Uh, she's actually the head of Department of Obstetrics and uh, Gynecology of Sungai Bulo, consultant obstetrician and gynecologist, and she would be joined by Dr. Nurhana Muhammad Kasim. Are you there, Dr. Nora Shikin, Dr. Nurhana from Sungai Bulo? You are there? Okay, give us a wave. Okay, that's it. And uh, the topic that you'll be presenting today is mothers with COVID-19. So without further ado, can, can you start off the session over there in Sungai Buloh? Over to, to Sungai Buloh now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shamsha. I would like to, I would like to uh, um, allow Dr. Nohana to do the presentation. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm uh, Dr. Nohanai from UNG in Hospital Sungai Bulo. Um, basically, um, we're going to, I'm going to present about one of our cases. I think it was the first um, patient with COVID positive um, who we ended up um, forming a cesarean section for her. It's one of um, the first patients. We've had a total of eight patients who are who has delivered in our centre. Um, Seven of them were by cesarean section and only one had vaginal delivery, which we delivered by uh, vacuum extraction. Um, four of them were uh, COVID positive, the rest were PUIs. Okay. Okay. Um, our patient was Madam N. Uh, she was a 31 year old lady um, who came on the 17th of no, sorry, on the 18th of March 2020. She was a gravida 2 para 1. Um, when she came to us, she was 36 weeks plus 5 days period of amenorrhea. Her complaint was um, a history of two day history of fever, cough, and myalgia on the 17th of uh, March. Um, she had a previous scar uh, in 2015, season detection for breach and preeclampsia. Um, she also has maternal obesity with a BMI of 29.2 kilograms per meter square. She has anemia and pregnancy, just mild one of HBF 9.8. She has proteinuria and pregnancy, um, but she remained normotensive and her PE profiles were normal. Uh, we also had an ultrasound QB, which was normal also. Um, so her contact history was um, on the 7th of March, she had a contact with a uh, relative um, who was positive um, uh, COVID-19. Um, she remained quite well until the 16th of March where she started to have fever cough um, with Wallisic sputum and followed the next day by having uh, di diarrhea, myalgia, alkalgia and um, a bit of um, shortness of breath. Uh, she wasn't in labour and the fetal movements were good so she went to Hospital Ampang um, and because of the history of contact and uh, URTI symptoms she was referred to us as the PUI. Um, the first swab was taken here and it was positive. Uh, on and the customers was alert and conscious, her uh, uh, vitals were stable, she was not tachycardic, um, she was not dyspneic and she had no fever. Um, her chest, her lungs were clear. The chest x ray, when we initially when we reviewed, we thought we saw possible pneumonic patches on the bilateral lower zones. So the impression at that time was she was COVID positive, the category 3A. Um, this was the chest x-ray, it might not be clear to you guys. Um, so uh, this was taken on day two of admission, so it was admitted on the 17th. Um, before the report came back, um, we treated her as two, uh, 3A. However, when the report came back from the radiology, the, um, the report said that there was no significant radiographic abnormalities. So the device diagnosis was to be shortened. Where is the screen? 
Classification for COVID. Um, a big one is asymptomatic. I think it's, um, by now everybody knows it. Okay. Um, this, this is the treatment that um, that we give according to the stage. Um, I think some of them can be OD. So the progress of the patient. Um, on the 18th, she complained of reduced fetal movement, and on the depth tone, it showed that uh, there was fetal bradycardia. Uh, when the CTP was reassuring. But because of the possible worsening of the COVID and um, reduced the movement, the patient was spent for elective fetal infection on the 18th. Um, the surgery went, was uneventful. Um, the baby was in the presentation, delivered a good sized baby, 2.6 kg, good upper score. The placenta was disposed as per protocol. Um, the baby was handed over to feed, and the mother at that point was advised not for breastfeeding. Um, subsequently, um, this is the swap history. Um, the admission swap was positive. The subsequent three swaps were positive also, but the day 13 swap came back negative because she was discharged the following day. Um, yeah, she remained asymptomatic up to the day of discharge, and we were uh, we advised her to home quarantine for the, uh, for another two weeks, and we will be seeing her in KK in six weeks time. Uh, so. So the uh, baby was delivered by elective uh, cesarean section for COVID-19 positive mother in labor. The uh, baby was uh, premature at 36 weeks, 5 days, with a birth weight of 2.65 and uh, appropriate length and head circumference. Apple score was good, 9 and 10, and the uh, cord screenings were all normal. The uh, normal uh, vitamin K and happy was given in OT. The delivery as per protocol was attended by a pediatrician with a complete PPE. We had a PAPR on standby if you need to do any aerosol generating procedures. And he was admitted to our NICU in a special isolation uh, room with negative pressure, accompanied by staff nurse and uh, other uh, healthcare workers in complete PPE. So the uh, genome detection test was done at day one and day 13 of life. The patient uh, is going to go home today. It's only been two weeks since the last uh, uh, delivery and uh, it was not detected. The baseline blood that we took for this baby did not show any of the uh, possible signs of uh, COVID-19 infection, such as leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, race, CRP, or transaminitis. The nursing care was done as per routine and uh, feeding and vital signs monitoring was with PPEs in the isolation room. And uh, after the first uh, week of life, the baby was spotted in the quarantine area uh, out of the isolation room as uh, you know, the babies need to actually drop out of the isolation rooms once they are uh, much better and the, uh, what call it, the PCR test is negative. And uh, like I said, the baby was totally discharged without any issues uh, at uh, two weeks of life. So far, the uh, cumulative pediatric COVID 19 patients in Sungai Budo, we have three uh, units of uh, COVID confirmed mothers which uh, turn out to be negative. In the general pediatric side, uh, infants number six, we have a few toddlers, up to seven of them, and uh, the more than four years old is total nine. So we have a total of uh, close to uh, 25 patients in uh, Sungai Budo Hospital itself. Uh, next one. These are some of the blood investigations for the pediatric COVID-19 positive patients in Sungai Bulo. The uh, first two uh, was a cluster of uh, patients from the Chinese cohort from Singapore. This one, class one in Langkawi and Sirumban, uh, was our first uh, write up for the uh, initial uh, four pediatric patients in Malaysia. And uh, they were all uh, quite asymptomatic. And as you can see from the uh, current cohort that we have up to number 22, uh, most of them did not have uh, much of uh, leukopenia uh, and no thrombocytopenia noted. The CRP was not raised in all of them and the ALPs uh, and ALPs transaminases were all normal. So all the babies remained asymptomatic. We do have one patient who uh, had pneumonia, uh, two actually that we transferred to HKL because here in Sunakula we're taking the uh, stage one and stage two. Once they reach stage three, 
uh, we certify our care to HPL as they have uh, intensivists there and uh, much uh, more attention there. But so far, most of them have been asymptomatic except the two patients that we sent to HPL uh, about a week ago. Um, now we just like to share some um, of our experiences that things that um, we encountered along the way, um, questions that arose. So basically, it's um, all this just timing of delivery, mode of delivery, what, um, about the content, um, what happens uh, to patients who are um, in imminent vaginal delivery, patient of unsure status, what kind of PPE is required, where to deliver, who to attend the delivery and all that. So basically, um, all these um, questions are addressed in the guideline. Um, now, this is the latest edition 5. Which came back, which came out, I think, about the twenty fifth of March. Uh, I just would like to highlight a few. Um, yeah, uh, all designated hospitals, hospitals which deliver uh, any PUI or COVID patients should have an identified labor room, preferably with negative pressure ventilation. Okay, to manage PUI and confirm patients, um, and you should also have a designated OT. It shouldn't be a common OT with uh, non PUI patients. Um, Patients in labor should be offered cesarean section as a mode of delivery until more evidence of, on safety of vaginal delivery is established. Um, handling of body fluids, specimens, including placenta and patients' apparel, should be handled based on standard universal precaution. Mm -hmm. So, um, breastfeeding should ideally be deferred until confirmatory diagnosis includes COVID infection in mother. Um, this is, also, this is uh, our the delivery suite in the COVID ward. Um, this is for patients who are actually, according to the guideline, if they are admitted um, 6 p.m. or more with uh, immune delivery and there's not enough time for you to get to OT, uh, you should have a designated um, delivery suite. And this is one that is basically outside our PAC. Um, in the parking lot, we make, we've made a tent um, where patients who come with us fully who might not even have time to go to the COVID ward, so they will be delivered outside. Um, Okay, so um, the mode of delivery, like I said before, um, in view of the concern coupled by the fact that almost all centers do not have negative pressure equipped labor suite, PUIs should be offered a civilian section as a mode of delivery, yeah, unless the delivery is imminent, because we do not have um, enough evidence of, uh, on the intrapartum management. Um, the placenta, um, it's just treated like a normal RBD placenta, uh, disposed by the hospital, not given to the patient or husband. Um, for the PPE, um, this one is for aerosol generating procedures like um, all this incubation and all that. But um, I think to note this uh, surgery um, where high speed devices are used, um, we do not use any high, high speed devices, but uh, during Vaginal delivery, there are a lot of pushing and straining and um, the patient sometimes do not comply with the using of masks. So I think that, that can be a bit of um, a risk also. Okay, so this is the re uh, recommended type of PPE. The preferred one is PAPR, um, powered air purifier, purified respirator, um, isolation gown, um, like a tie-back suit, uh, glove, goggles with face shield and shoe cover. There's this is the second option if you do not have a PAPR. It's just a tie suit, N95 with goggles, gloves and shoe cover. And if you really don't have any, um, N95, ISO gown, gloves, goggles and shoe and head cover. Okay. Uh, during a scissoring section, you must minimize your, um, the stuff in the OT. You should not have more than six. Okay. So um, the specialist uh, does a scissoring section with one medical officer to assist you. The NS and the NS medical officer, you must get the senior one to do the case, okay? Because you do not want a failed final and you do not want intubation. Um, one scrub nurse and one circulating nurse who also access baby nurse to receive the baby, also access um, uh, and the nurse who get the baby and passes uh, the baby to the feet waiting outside. The feet do not stand inside the OT. Uh, 
in the uh, ward, you might need to do a scan or a CTG for patients in the antenatal period. So you should assign one machine um, for your COVID and QI patients. You must wrap your machines and um, clean the machine after each use. Use a probe cover. Uh, if you do not have um, a plastic wrap for your machine, you can just use um, wipes uh, after each use. Okay. Uh, also, you need to designate the pathway where you transport your patients uh, in our, in our setting, it's just a uh, take-off area where you should not mix with clean areas. Thank you from Sungai Ulo. We're back to you, Dr. Hisham Shah. Thank you. Uh, the, the second um, Presentation would be from uh, Dr. Tahira Jamal Muhammad from uh, Pediatric uh, Institute, previously Pediatric Institute, now Hospital Tunku Aziza. Yeah? Uh, she will be talking on managing COVID-19 in children. Dr. Tahira, are you there? Yeah. Assalamualaikum. Okay. Please, you can probably now proceed. Assalamualaikum and good morning. Okay. Thank you for the organizer for inviting me to give this talk today. Okay. I'll start off with uh, what we know about the pathophysiology of COVID-19. Okay. The virus is novel coronavirus SARS coronavirus 2 discovered in December 2019 and the disease is called COVID-19. This virus is extremely contagious particularly where there's close contact between people and then the reproduction number or R0 is about three. That means one person will end up infecting three more. What is the mechanism of infection by this virus? Virus directly infects cell via ACE2 receptor and children's lung express ACE receptor less than adult lung. Hence, the infection in children seems to be less severe. Other than this direct invasion by this virus, there's also a thing called a cytokine storm where there's a cascade process where the virus lead to increased level of cytokine that's caused direct tissue damage, recruitment of neutrophils to tissues and other pro-inflammatory effect. This can lead to ARDS. There are a lot of cytokine being implemented, uh, implicated, but among them, what interests most people is IL-6. The disease complication, it can be pulmonary and extra-pulmonary. And for extra pulmonary involvement, it can even lead to multi-organ failure in severe or fatal illness. Cardiac dysfunction can be due to virus-induced direct damage since cardiac tissue does carry ACE receptor or hypoxic damage. Other things that the virus causes will be pericarditis, liver damage, renal failure in severe infection. Clinical manifestation of this virus Incubation period ranges from 1 to 14 days, mostly ranging from 3 to 7 days. So hence the home quarantine for 14 days. Most of the children who would turn out to be COVID positive had close contact with infectious cases or were from family cluster cases. No symptom on admission consistently predict outcome in children, though in adult, high fever on admission was seen in subsequent development of ARDS and death. When you look at symptoms in children, majority of children were asymptomatic. And if they have symptoms, the commonest one will be fever and cough, about 50% each. And fever in children tends to subside within three days. The cough is typically dry. If they have productive cough, only 3%. People also reported myalgia, lethargy, GI symptom of abdominal discomfort, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and diarrhea. The clinical management of confirmed cases, this is the clinical staging that was showed earlier, from stage 1 to stage 5, asymptomatic. Symptomatic, no pneumonia, where you have only upper respiratory symptom. Stage 3, symptomatic pneumonia. We also subclassify into A and B, like 3A with fever, 3B without fever. 
Four, symptomatic pneumonia requiring supplemental oxygen. And five, critically ill with multi-organ involvement. Stage 2 and 3 can be further classified based on the presence of absence of warning sign. Usually in adult, it occurs after day 7. The warning signs are recurrence of fever or persistent fever, dropping absolute lymphocyte count, increasing CRP and tachycardia. The next few minutes, we'll be talking on case. The first case is an 8 months old baby boy, admitted on 24th of March with no known medical illness. Fever and cough for four days, bit rhinorrhea, diarrhea for one day. And a history of contact with grandfather who is positive for COVID-19 a week prior to illness. Tolerating breastfeeding well, so he was admitted to a COVID-designated hospital for further management. On examination, a well thriving baby with temperature of 38.5, heart rate 160 beats per minute, spirit 55 minutes. March chest recession, saturation 98% on room air, lung caused crepitation bilaterally, cardiovascular and rest of system examination normal. So clinical staging for this baby, COVID positive, uh, with evidence of pneumonia without need for oxygen supplementation. Okay. This was his x-ray. Tachy opacity bilaterally, very highlight area, no consolidation. Day one of admission is day five of illness for this boy. He had a respiratory of 55, temperature 38.5, saturation 98% on room air, total white count only 8, lymphocyte 44%, CRP 15. By day three, uh, Day 7 of illness, the temperature was 37.5, total white count 9.1, lymphocyte 58% and he was referred for COVID antiviral therapy. The result for COVID-19 from the swab came back positive the next day and by day 5 admission or day 9 illness it turned negative and then subsequent uh, test was also negative. Blood culture were no growth and the rest of the panel for the viruses were all negative. He was referred for antiviral treatment for COVID-19 on day 7 of illness. Indication, symptomatic COVID-19, category 3, high risk group because he was infant and child was on antibiotic already. So, following ECG to look for QTC interval, he was started a combination therapy of uh, lopinavir, lutinavir, and also hydroxychloroquine. Child remained well with no symptom. IV antibiotic was continued, and antivirus stopped at day five. Second case, a ten-month-old baby, boy, date of admission twenty-six of March, presented with fever and cough for eight days. Initially treated as URTI by KK in discharge home presented to another hospital for tachypnea on 26th of March for one day. History of contact with parents positive for COVID-19 and referred to COVID-designated hospital for further management. He was born borderline prime, 36 weeks, birth weight of 2.1 kilo with G6PD deficiency. On examination, he's a well thriving baby in respiratory distress, temperature of 38 degrees Celsius, Heart rate 150 beats per minute, respirate 56 beats per minute, saturation 98% on room air, improved to 98% after 2 liter of oxygen, lungs cause crepitation bilaterally, a cardiovascular rest of systemic examination were all normal. So, clinical staging for this baby, uh, stage 4, evidence of pneumonia and require oxygen supplementation. This is his x-ray. He also had bilateral very high lung opacity, left more than right, which is even worse from the first case. Okay. So day one of admission, day eight of illness, the respiratory rate was 50, temperature 38, 38 degrees Celsius, saturation 98% on nasoprong oxygen, total white count 10.4, Absolute lymphocyte count 7.3 and CRP 11. By day 3, 
day 10 of illness, the rest is getting better. A febrile, saturation 99%, white count 7.3, BALC 5.5, and CRP coming down trend. The test for COVID-19 that was sent on day one became positive, and by day five or day 12, an illness was negative, followed with another negative result next day. Blood culture with no growth, and then the panel for the other viruses were all negative. He was commenced on intravenous amoxicillin acid since admission and continued just before discharge. Initially, we covered him with ozitalumine until the result for influenza came back negative. He was not started with any other antiviral for COVID, like the first case. Since by the time he came to us, his category has already improved. From 4A, he became 3. He was able to off oxygen, so we did not start him only anti-COVID treatment like the first case. Sharing with you our cases that we've seen in HKL. Since we started seeing uh, children uh, investigated as PUI in February 2020, we have a total of 28 cases. But from this group of children who were travelers with their parents, none of the children came back positive for COVID. But number of children positive for influenza was about 10% and for adenovirus 3%. Almost all treated for community acquired pneumonia. Until yesterday, we had a total of 16 COVID positive children. All came from a close contact of family cluster. Age less than one, four of them, two to five, three, uh, above five, nine year old. Uh, above five, about nine uh, children, 56%. None have comorbidities. Majority of them were asymptomatic, category 1. Category 2, fever and upper respiratory symptom, 8%. And category 3, pneumonia, 12%. And mind you, our denominator is very small. Up to yesterday, there were a total of 76 uh, kids with COVID positive all over Malaysia. For the next three slides, I'm going to put up principle and uh, management for COVID positive children, starting from antibiotic. So paracetamol is still our first line antibiotic. We should avoid uh, and say ibuprofen in children with poor flu uh, fluid intake or suspected AKI. There's a theoretical risk of upregulating the ACE receptor. For fluid therapy, most children with my illness do not require any fluid restriction. However, if the children have respiratory compromise, Consider fluid restriction as this may reduce the risk of ARDS. For bronchodilators, this is not a common problem in children with COVID-19. So bronchodilators should not be used routinely unless there's a strong suspicion of bronchoconstriction. If you want to use them, it's via MDI and spaces. Avoid nebulization. It's another, uh, another procedure that generates aerosol. For antibiotic, used in children with comorbidities, and if they are unusually sick uh, at day one of admission, or if they are not showing improvement by day three, particularly fever or, or still on oxygen, or if they have risk CRP or WBC, especially beyond day seven, that is the critical period. And if you follow the adult guideline to anticipate the cytokine storm, we can have this baseline serum ferritin, D-dimer, and LDH. Antibiotic is also indicated if the feature of sepsis or the, if the child having productive cough. How about use of antiviral and immunomodulators? So there was no proven efficacy of any drug for human as of March 23rd, 2020. Chinese guidelines for COVID-19 suggest using chloroquine traditional Chinese medicine and for NTLR6 drug tocilizumab as an anti-inflammatory in patients with extensive lung disease, severe illness and elevated IR6 level. This, recommend, uh, this recommendation, however, are not yet uh, supported by robust clinical evidence. 
However, uh, your combo HIV drug, Lopinawe Ritunawe, was widely used in China. But the first ever randomized control trial involving 199 adult patients in China yielded no benefit. Time for clinical improvement and mortality at 21 days, there was no difference between cases and control. How about systemic steroid? Systemic steroid should not be used as a treatment for COVID-19. For other antiviral, no trial of antiviral medication have been conducted in children with COVID-19. So the use of antiviral is not recommended yet in children. Currently, among the drugs going on trial, a Ramdesaway is a drug used for Ebola previously and now showing in vitro good in vitro data where it can cause SARS uh, coronavirus 1 and 2. And the other drug is in the pipeline is Fapi Pirawe. It's an anti-flu drug used in Japan for flu A and B, which also sold a lot of promise. How about our old anti-malaria drug? Chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine may have antiviral activity. The mechanism for this is unclear. But in vitro studies suggest it may modify virus receptor binding by interfering with the alkalization of the phagolysosome. So in children, among all the drugs that have used been, uh, for adult, this show more promise. But it's unlikely to have any clinical significant benefit when given routinely, but may be considered in the rare event of uh, ICU admission. But as we all know, this drug was first licensed to be used in a uh, human uh, in World War II. So it has its all side effects. So you have to do ECG to look for QTC interval. It's contra in, uh, you need to precaution if you have diabetes. You need to have to, uh, look for retinal problem and so on. And also a lot of drug-drug interaction, especially if you're using it with uh, Talitra or Lopinawe Vitinawe. If you look at mortality per se, as if uh, uh, March 14, 2020, there was no death for people below age of 10. And if you look at the mortality rate in US compared by CDC, there's also no death below uh, individual less than 90 years of age. But now there's a change. There was recently a report of infant dying in US. When you look at uh, children and severe COVID-19, there's a respiratory review of large group of children from China. Total children, 2,143 of them. Severe disease or category 4 is about 5.6%. Critically ill, category 5, about 0.6%. And one death among a 16-year-old adolescent. There are five uh, key principles for good practice during the pandemic. One is uh, reassurance. So if you have not convinced yet, children have a mild, milder disease compared to adults. In Italy, among 22,000 people with COVID-19, there were 1,625 deaths, but none in people younger than 30 years. In China, among 2,000 134 children with COVID-19, only one died. And we need to actively involve our parents, especially parents of children with comorbidity, because they also need this reassurance. And as the disease evolves, we might see new things. We are not sure yet how our children with comorbid will, uh, will perform if they are infected with this virus. So when they are in the hospital, we have to advise them the use of masks, wash hand, and during this MCO, try not to overpeat our children and make them obese and not uh, expose them to smoking so that if they get virus, this virus infection, they will not have it quite bad. And number two, minimize spread of virus in hospital by managing the children and adults in same facility so we can maximize our resources, PPE in an isolation room, 
and also be must back in community by having good infection control procedure even at home. Even though children have mild diseases, but they seem to secrete their virus in their oral pharynx and also their nose quite longer. So they might be implicated in continued transmission in the community. The other thing will be sharing data and knowledge like now. We have to regularly see our MOH website for COVID-19 update and also the other guidelines. Okay, this is my last slide. Thank you. Uh, I've not been to the hospital for many, many weeks now. <laughs> I'm stuck in Putrajaya. Thank you for updating us uh, from uh, your experience uh, dealing with babies, children with uh, COVID-19. So next uh, in the agenda is uh, the update on uh, post-delivery of a baby uh, from the first case. For this, I think uh, I would like to invite Dr. C. Kui Ching, our neonatologist and also uh, the head of department uh, of pediatrics in Hospital Sungai Buloh. Uh, Dr. C., you got yep. the, the, the Zoom <laughs> webinar <laughs> to present. Okay, thank you, thank you Dr. Isham. Hi, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we have discussed about the case just now on the um, uh, first case uh, that was delivered uh, with, from a COVID positive mother uh, on the 18th of March. And uh, that was our first uh, COVID uh, positive mother who delivered in this hospital. Subsequently, there were three other uh, mothers with COVID positive confirmed cases who delivered in this hospital all by cesarean section. And so far, we have close to about uh, nine uh, PUI cases, uh, which uh, uh, was also delivered in this hospital so far. We have seen some uh, horizontal transmission of uh, cases uh, from the community. We have a day 20 of live baby who uh, was also COVID positive and uh, so far has been asymptomatic. And I think uh, in Ipoh, they have a day 12 of live uh, baby uh, who was also admitted for the same reason. So. Um, the uh, issues uh, with the uh, handling of uh, perinatal uh, COVID mothers is the uh, degree of um, uh, what they call it uh, healthcare personal uh, protection that you need to have and uh, to uh, arrange or uh, to um, put your resources in place so that uh, it is a seamless process that uh, will benefit both the mother and also the baby and the healthcare worker. Uh, I'm, I'm lucky because uh, the Hospital uh, Sungai Bulo is actually 100% COVID hospital. So we do not have any non-COVID cases here. And our core business is just uh, COVID patients, whether it's from the uh, maternal side, the uh, neonatal side, or the uh, pediatric side. Of uh, course, the uh, patients who are stage 3 and A and above are sent to Hospital Kuala Lumpur for better management. And uh, at the moment, uh, what I can share with you is that uh, you need to actually have, uh, as Dr. Hana said just now, a designated uh, OT and also a team that can handle uh, uh, maternity cases that is due for delivery. And uh, it actually takes time for these things to be assembled, for the uh, process to be uh, done, and also for the baby to be sent back to the isolation rooms. And hence, therefore, they have also uh, mechanisms in place for the uh, sudden admissions of mothers who are in uh, uh, imminent delivery that they do in front of the PAC is a special tent that is uh, uh, what they call it uh, constructed for this process. And um, if the patients are needing uh, also uh, intubation, none so far, then they also have the PAPR sets and which the patients will be intubated in a uh, different ward before being sent to the uh, OT. So all these things are in place to ensure there is a seamless. Uh, uh, management of the uh, mother and also the baby post delivery. Now, a few things about the neonatal resuscitation uh, that we need to have uh, in place. Things will change a bit. These are unusual times. So, in unusual times, you need to have unusual decisions and also protocols. Uh, one of it is also the uh, for the neonatal resuscitation, we tend to uh, uh, protect ourselves and from the baby. Although so far, none of the babies actually needed to be intubated and um, generate an aerosol generating procedure. In the case that the baby needs to be intubated, then we have a PAPR on standby. And uh, these things should be done actually in a negative pressure room. And uh, at the same time, we also have uh, viral filters for our uh, PPVs, you know, our uh, self-inflating bags 
I think not, not many of us use low inflating bags and if you have a viral filter there. And uh, most of the equipments need to be disposable equipments. Uh, and uh, I think uh, we, we thank the uh, ministry for providing us uh, some of these equipments that we can actually use in uh, those circumstances. And uh, we also avoid NIVs and also high flow nasal cannulas in this uh, group of patients because uh, it is supposed to be uh, aerosol generating. And uh, for those which we need to intubate, our ventilators uh, devoid of any humidifiers. Again, it's also an aerosolization of the gases uh, and this can be hazardous to the uh, staff in the NICU. And uh, for suctions, we need to use uh, in-line suctions or full system and we do not do open suctions. And uh, if you have your uh, light scope or video laryngoscopy, that would be an added advantage uh, in this uh, time of uh, pandemic. And our team for intubations are limited numbers. We have a specialist on standby. We have a senior MO who can intubate. And uh, we chose the most experience of the group that can attend the delivery. And we try to put any staff who has comorbidities, for example, if they are pregnant or they're immunosuppressed, to be in the team. And uh, we have defined roles for them during the uh, procedure so that everyone knows what is going on. And um, this is very important as you are dealing with a potentially hazardous uh, patient. There is planning before the, uh, the patient is delivered. There should be good communication uh, during the resuscitation uh, process. And uh, everyone from the leader to the other two assistants should have good communication roles. There's also sometimes good cognitive aids that we put at the side of the uh, resuscitation table so that everyone can look at it from time to time, especially when you are down up, you are, you are hot, sweaty, and sometimes you can't even do it properly. You know, you need to have aids to remind you on the certain steps that you need to take. And that we provide at the uh, delivery area, whether it's for cesarean and in the rest of the status of one patient which we delivered through a uh, vaginal delivery. And uh, so far, we have no issues with the PPE supply in this hospital. And that is the first thing that we highlight to all new personnel entering the uh, NICU, that you must protect yourself first and learn to don and doff and use the uh, uh, required PPEs in any situation and uh, so on and so forth. Um, so um, based on that, uh, so, so far, we have uh, good outcomes in all the uh, nine PUI cases and uh, the three COVID uh, the three COVID uh, positive mothers with uh, their babies, one of them has already been discharged and two are still in the ward. Uh, I think that's uh, my update for the uh, new NATO part of uh, this uh, uh, teleconference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. C. Uh, I, th I think this is actually a very novel situation for everybody. This virus is actually unknown and how we address the virus is actually something that none of us have actually been uh, prepared for in a sense. I think taking cognizance from our experience with SARS before this and MERS-CoV and also, you know, uh, the preparedness of our people in the front line. I think we, we have actually uh, stepped up to the challenge. Uh, it, just now we heard from Dr. Tahira how we manage children with uh, COVID in our midst. And also you have actually first-hand experience of how you handle babies born out of uh, mothers, you know, with uh, COVID-19. And, and uh, it is very gratifying to note that babies uh, born uh, in this scenario is, can, can be, uh, you know, are well. And uh, it is also very encouraging to note that they are on the way to recovery and they have been discharged. So that is uh, coming from uh, Sungai Buloh. At ground zero in the COVID hospital, uh, next in the agenda would be uh, the panel discussion. Um, and uh, I think for the past couple of uh, days, and we've collected uh, questions from people. And then uh, as we go along, listening in to the discussion from uh, Dr. Norashikin and Dr. Nurhana uh, from uh, the ONG department in Sungai Buloh, talking about mothers with COVID and how they deliver these mothers. And then uh, I think we've got the, the, the question, which is actually uh, coming up now. You can do that. Okay, uh, I need to read this question up uh, for everybody that's actually on the different channel. Uh, there is this question to Dr. Tahira. Dr. Tahira, are you still there? I can't see you and I can't hear you. I mean, are you there? I don't know. Okay, okay you're there. I'm here. I'm here, Dr. 
Okay, together with us, I think we've got Dr. Tan Kaki as well as the panel member. Dr. Tan Kaki is actually our pediatric infectious disease consultant who has now retired and is now, I think, a professor in uh, IMU. Perdana. In Perdana, okay, Perdana University. So he's also, he's also uh, on board today. I mean, uh, is Dr. Tan Kaki there? Can you give us a shout or a wave or something like that? Dr. Tan, are you there? Dr. Tan Kaki? He's there, but he... You're there? Oh, okay, you're, you're keeping uh, silent. Okay, uh, you're mute. So I think uh, the first question to uh, Dr. Tahira. Uh, Dr. Tahira, you mentioned that the virus targets the ACE2 receptors. Is that the angiotensin 2 receptor? Yes, Dr. Hisham, it is. Okay, that's the angiotensin 2 receptor. So this yes. has got something to do with the pathophysiology of the uh, SARS-CoV-2, yeah? It targets yes. the ACE2 uh, receptors, and you know, uh, then you can actually get the uh, what you call it involution of the virus into the uh, the cells, and that's how you get the infection in the lower respiratory tracts. Apparently, okay. The other question: uh, there is a circular stating that all patients with SARI and pneumonia should be handled as COVID nineteen patient until proven otherwise. So this is addressing the pediatric group. Is this circular also applicable to the pediatric age group? Can I have the uh, answer probably from Dr. Tan Kaki? Because we need to listen to you. You're somewhere in Seremban, Dr. Tan? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Loud and clear. I can yeah, even okay, see fine. your face there. Yeah, hi, okay. <laughs> uh, good afternoon to all of you. I yes. think uh, under the present uh, situation, under the pandemic, uh, obviously there is no way we can tell uh, whether a child who presents to us will have uh, COVID-19 infection or not. In fact, uh, we have had like cases uh, screened for COVID-19, but it was negative, but actually turned out to be influenza A. So there are other kinds of infection uh, during this current uh, pandemic. Uh, which obviously uh, you are aware past couple of months there were problems with influenza for the last uh, three to four months at least. So other the current climate when you are not really sure and when you have uh, COVID-19 around us, I think it should be until proven otherwise. So we need to do the screening for uh, COVID-19 and then obviously uh, if that is negative and this is a severe case, obviously, then you would have to rule out other viral and bacterial infections. Yeah. Okay. So, so you know, the take home message is treat all patients in the ICU, those with pneumonia, with SARI, you know, as COVID positive until proven otherwise. Yeah. So that's actually the message that we are trying to send out. So this is regardless of whether it is pediatrics or adult patients. So given the current pandemic situation, we have got to be cautious, yeah? It's better to err on the cautious rather than to be a bit more, you know, easy going with uh, these uh, patients, yeah? So that's actually the message by uh, Dr. Tan. Okay, the next question. This is actually uh, to, for our ONG team at Ground Zero Sungai Buloh. Uh, Caesar for only COVID-positive COVID patient. So th this is the question. What about all those other PUI patients? or SARI, or patients with uh, acute respiratory infection, and also with uh, those with ILI patients. I mean, how would you actually address those category of pregnant patients due for delivery? Caesar as well, or standard way of delivering? Um, for, yes, for COVID-positive patients who are um, confirmed COVID-positive, yes, we do Caesar all of them for now. Um, and like I said, unless they are in imminent um, delivery. For patients who have um, who are PUI, yes, we do treat them as um, COVID positive until proven otherwise. So yes, um, we section them. But uh, if possible, we wait. Um, let's say something that like three six weeks with uh, uh, PUI. Um, if we can wait until the swabs come back as negative or um, uh, delay the delivery, then we delay the delivery and then we treat them as normal. But if it, there's not enough time to wait, let's say she is already 39 weeks and you need to deliver her and she's PUI, 
um, so we treat them as COVID and we do section them. But okay. uh, for okay. other patients who are like um, has uh, ILI or SARI, unless they have significant contact history or travel history, then we do not treat them as PUI. Like, Okay, I think that's a very prudent kind of approach. You have to be very cautious. So if you suspect it is actually can be potentially COVID, you're going to actually seizure this patient. So that's good. Yeah, because sometimes uh, there's some issue with the turnaround time for getting the COVID results. So yes. it's better to be a bit more cautious. Mm -hmm. Totally acceptable. I think that's a very uh, wise move. And you should be also quite careful when you're dealing with a potentially COVID positive patient into surgery because that's where you can probably get the aerosolization and you know the healthcare workers need to be a bit more cautious. Yeah, precaution uh, because you guys are the front line and we cannot afford to get any one of you to fall sick. So please stay strong and please stay safe, people on the ground. We salute your work uh, over there. Okay, for the next question, uh, this is with regard to breastfeeding, yeah? Because uh, any chance for the MOH to improve guideline in managing breastfeeding for suspected and confirmed cases of COVID-19 in mothers and babies? Okay. Who would you like to pick this up? Can I give the ONG side to answer this? Thank you, please. Yeah, I'm Dr. Nora here. Dr. Nora, okay. Yeah. Regarding this question, of course, if you ask that there is whether there's any chance of not, of course, there's always a chance for the Ministry of Health to improve the guidelines. But as for now, we do not have enough data. Although WHO can give some data to us, but the data is still not strong enough for us to ensure the safety of mothers and babies regarding breastfeeding. And of course, working under the umbrella of KKM, we follow the KKM guidelines. And as when the guidelines is going to change, then we will change our practice. Whatever it's now, we are dealing with a bug which we are not sure of what is the disease progression. Therefore, we do not want to take any unnecessary chances on our own population. Therefore, please, I really hope that those people who are asking me a lot of these questions on breastfeeding, please understand the situation that we are in now. We are not dealing with something that we, it is tangible, which is sure of. We are not. We can't take these chances for our mothers and babies. And because of that, of course, Ministry of Health will change the guidelines in according to WHO, but probably in the near future. Yeah? Okay, thank you. Okay, which uh, Dr. C would like to add on to that? Yes, Dr. Isham. Um, at the moment, the um, evidence from the uh, SARS uh, back in 2003 shows that uh, none of the uh, mothers um, who um, uh, what they call it, were pregnant and uh, had uh, delivery, there was no vertical transmission from that year. And uh, the evidence also from the breastfeeding from that time, 2003, did not show any transmission through the breast milk and the breast milk samples were all uh, negative. And we are seeing some early evidence from a uh, few case reports that uh, you know, the breast milk is actually uh, also negative apart from the uh, placental swabs, the amniotic fluid swabs, the vaginal swabs, all were negative. What we are worried about in Malaysia is the horizontal transmission from the mother to the baby. Uh, if the baby is sent to the mother in the ward, uh, of course the uh, British and the uh, Canadian guidelines advocate the use of masks and cleaning the breast before the baby is latched on. But um, th those kind of evidence at this time of pandemic, you know, can be quite uh, arbitrary and may not be something that, that you know, is uh, in line with infection control. So until more evidence comes out uh, from, uh, you know, more centers, especially those one advocating a liberal use of uh, breast milk and all, everything, then at the moment, I think we are taking it safe and uh, following the fifth edition of the ministry guidelines. And at the moment, so far, we have not had any horizontal uh, transmission from these, uh, these practices by uh, you know, keeping the baby from the mom and uh, so on and so forth. But uh, some of the evidence that occurred from the SARS time when uh, you know, there was a debate about these practices was that the use of pasteurization of breast milk, they may be uh, something uh, which is uh, practical and uh, solves the conundrum of uh, this uh, breastfeeding issue in a viral uh, pandemic like this. You know? 
that is my uh, opinion in this matter. Thank you. Okay, take home message is continue to breastfeed the babies, please. I think the benefit outweigh no. whatever it is. I think... <laughs> uh, no? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> okay we, are, we are going to probably, at the moment, we are dealing with something that unknown, then it's better to be cautious, yeah? <laughs> okay. Okay, do, do we have any dissenting views? Yeah, because you know, you need to actually have this, uh, you know, out in open so that the, the, the whole world will listen to you guys. So, so can, you, can somebody just, you know, shout it out? Do not breastfeed the babies if you are convinced it is actually COVID positive. Do not breastfeed your baby until you are COVID negative. Okay, is that all clear? Okay, this is very important. Huh? Dr. Tan Kaki, any, any, anything from you, a short one, before we go on? I think uh, what our obstetric colleague mentioned, uh, I think it's important we need to document COVID-19 negativity <laughs> in the mother who wants to breastfeed. And since we are already monitoring the PCR, yes, if the PCR is two times mm -hmm. negative, of course, obviously, the mm -hmm. risk of transmission would be uh, obviously not there. And as you mentioned, as Dr. C has mentioned earlier, I think there are some recent studies uh, suggesting that there's no evidence of the COVID-19 virus being detected in the breast milk. So once the mother has zero reverted to negative, it should be quite safe then. Yeah. Okay, so clear? Everybody's clear now? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Okay, the next question that people want to ask, people on the front line, how do you escalt it when you're wearing the full PPE or the PAPR? Can maybe Dr. Who's handling the ICU, uh, ICU patients? Dr. C or maybe Dr. Tahira? How do you escalt it patients when you're wearing the full PPE? I've not personally used PAPR. But if you're using full PPE, you can still able to auscultate quite well. PPR, I have no experience, Dr. Hisham. Okay, PPAPR is the one with that, you know, tubes coming out from the head. Yeah, at the back. Yes, is that yes. The, yeah, yeah. Never used that before. So, uh, Dr. C, have you actually used that before? Um, not at the moment, uh, Dr. Hisham, because um, all the babies have not needed any uh, intubation. But we stand by at the uh, OT if we need to. And um, yeah. in the time that they are, uh, you know, uh, waiting yeah, for the yeah, yeah, yeah. beyond, they are ready with the uh, ambu bags and the uh, virus. Whether you can see this or not, that's a, a PAPR. Maybe the, the obstetrician in the maternity OT, have you used this? Anesthetist. Anesthetist. Are you using the, the PAPR? We do use PAPR, but while doing the cesarean section, so auscultation was um, an issue. But uh, when, during, uh, when you use your PPE, and when you see COVID patients, sometimes you do need to auscultate. But you have to remember that your stethoscopes are clean until you touch the patient. So the, you clean your equipment in between the patient. And the ear piece is clean, so there's no issue. You can put in your, uh, your stethoscope um, under your, your PPR. And then um, when, after you examine the patient, you have to sterilize the equipment again. Like I said, the um, sterilization of equipment just now. Okay. You can't wrap your stethoscope, but you can clean your stethoscope afterwards. Yeah. We, we can't hear you quite clearly. I mean, can you actually bring the microphone nearer to you? Yeah. So, so what I, I'm trying, the, the thing that I can listen uh, here is actually saying, Dr. Hana saying that you have to clean your stethoscope before using the, the stethoscope on your patients. In between patients, you do have to clean all your equipment actually. So your okay, that is a tech home message, you know, clean your stethoscope and then do it properly because otherwise you'll be actually transmitting the virus from one patient to the other. Okay, that's actually standard of care, especially now. For each patient, usually in, uh, uh, like in ICU, you have one stethoscope um, with that patient. You do not take your the dirty stethoscope and go to another patient with a different with the same stethoscope. Exactly. So make sure that, you know, the universal precaution, making sure that infection control is strictly <laughs> adhered to, yeah? I mean, the one, uh, you use the stethoscope for the patient, that one is actually only reserved for that patient alone. So we shall move on. Um, 
Almost 70 to 80 percent of the pediatric patients are admitted due to ARI or ILI. Do you routinely recommend a COVID-19 screening for all pneumonia or SARI even without positive contact? Maybe Dr. Tahira can answer that. Do you now screen for COVID-19 for all such patients? Okay. Ideally, doctor, if you're living in ideal world, yes, I will recommend that. But right now, our lab cannot uh, process that kind of demand. So I still think at this point in time, we still need to screen who are we uh, sending the test for. And when there's any indication in doubt, uh, discuss with an uh, ID pediatrician. Okay. I think now the index of suspicion must be very high. If you suspect yes. this one may be uh, COVID-19, you would do the screen. Yes. In the ideal setting, you would screen all such patients. Yeah? Yes. So that was an idea. But uh, you need to actually look at the situation on the ground. But I think the guidelines now, those who are in the ICU, we consider them as potential COVID-positive patients. Yeah? Yes. And they should be uh, screened as well. Okay, we shall move on to the next question in, for the, in the interest of time. Uh, for COVID-19 designated hospitals, it is clear, but how about in non-COVID hospitals? Should we treat all SARI as COVID positive? Uh, who would like to take that on? Dr. Tahira, because yes. you are the ID pediatrician. Yes. Uh, maybe okay. Uh, I, I see Dr. Hana there. Is it Dr. Hana or Dr. Dr. Nora, uh, Nora Shikin? We look similar. Oh, similar. Yeah, yeah. Because with the mask, no, I cannot see you. Which one is Dr. Hana? Which is Dr. You are identical twins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. For non COVID hospitals. Can you answer that? Okay, for non COVID Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. okay. Right, for non-COVID-19 designated, of course. For non-COVID hospitals, we actually discuss with our ID physician. Okay. So the decision or the leader of a non-COVID hospital is still an ID physician. Pending on the discussion and a conclusion will then be reached. Then we will decide that the patient is actually a SARI or not. But again, for ONG, we decide, but we actually, our decision is also made together with the physician, not just on our side. Thank you. Okay, so discuss this with your physician and come to a conclusion, yeah? Okay, that is the other question. Okay, that, the other question from uh, Dr. Angeline Moi, I think, probably. This one is directed to Dr. C. Uh, neonatologist to neonatologist. <laughs> So it is mentioned that during LSCS, LSCS during a C-section, the pediatrics team would wait outside the OT. What if resuscitation is needed in the OT? Is there time for the pediatrics MO to don the PPE and run in to resuscitate the baby? Question for you? Uh, no, no, Dr. Isham, we are actually in the OT, but at the uh, different part of the uh... OT at, at the back, you know, with our open wounds and our PPEs. So we are actually ready. It's not actually outside the OT. We are past the airlock. We are also already in the OT at the side there. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, so you, you hear that, Dr. Angeline? They are ready. They are already with the uh, PPE and they are inside the OT and, you know, within the airlock. So they are okay. Once it is actually out, then they are going to actually go in and help the baby if uh, they require resuscitation. Okay, the other one from Anonymous, uh, this is also a pediatric question. If we are treating pediatric SARI or ARI as COVID posit positive until proven otherwise, does this mean we swap them, isolate and full PPE? So I th shall probably ask uh, Dr. Tahira from Hospital Tunku Aziza, how would you do this? So, okay. For all uh, children who are coming with ARI symptom, I always tell people to isolate them in the cubicle. So that anybody who enter the cubicle should be at least wearing a, a 
three ply uh, mask before entering uh, the patient cubicle to manage these children. And if you are saying this is sorry, then I expect this child to be placed in the single room isolation and for the doctor to use at least uh, three ply uh, mask and for the nurses who are performing the swaps to do to wear a full PPE, like full sleeve, uh, uh, water repellent gown, uh, N95 mask, and also face shield before they take the sample. So that if the test came back positive, we don't have to close ward or close the hospital. Okay. So that, that's actually the, the way we actually we handle a uh, patient who was suspected with uh, COVID positive. Okay, the other question, we've got a lot of questions. We've got 60 questions and the numbers are climbing. We have only about 20 minutes. So, stay on. Yeah, you can stay on. Okay. Uh, the next question with regards to treatment, yeah? When should we initiate uh, rotinavir and ritonavir, which is calitra, and hydroxychloroquine? Uh, so, what is actually the the uh, algorithm? When should you initiate this treatment? Uh, I think probably Dr. Tahira, because you are you are treating patients. Can, can you answer okay. that? Okay. Since it's a novel disease, and then most of the report is only weak evidence based, it's quite difficult to formulate clinical decision. Even uh, in US and Europe, uh, among the critical care society. They are against using uh, Ritunawe and also Lopinawe with hydrochloroquine even in their critically ill adult. So my take will be in the children who may be in ICU with the maybe stage 4 or stage 5. If you want to use, the only thing we have at this point in time is hydroxychloroquine. And later when you have the Remdesivir or Fabiravin, then you have other choice. Okay. Uh, the other question is, uh, I think probably this is for Dr. C, you know, because this is newborn. In hospitals with shortage of PPE, should newborns be kept uh, NPO until result is out, which usually takes about 48 hours, or continue with three hour of feeds, but staff wearing basic PPE only? What is your practice in Sungai Buloh? Now, um, in this group of babies, we have two groups. One, we have a preterm delivery, and then the other one was a term baby. Of course, in the preterm one, then you have to follow your uh, uh, follow in uh, feeding uh, your premature babies. It may not be full feeding, and uh, you might have to uh, start at uh, certain protocols. Just for the term babies that we have so far, we have not kept them new by mouth at any time. Uh, for us, uh, these babies are actually well. The uh, risk of vertical transmission is very low. So at no time do we keep them nil by mouth. We feed them uh, after they have uh, gone through the, uh, uh, what they call it, top and tail, uh, given the uh, vitamin K's, had knees, and stabilized. And we feed at the moment they are all ready for the feeding. It's just that uh, the, uh, like, like we discussed just now, the um, type of feeding uh, is uh, of an issue of a controversy at the moment. But as for keeping them nil by mouth, I don't think that's something uh, we practice even in non-COVID babies. So uh, at this time, we are feeding most of them, even the ones which are stable, the pre premature ones, we are also starting feeding quite early nowadays. Thank you. Okay, please feed your babies, yeah? Don't overfeed them, <laughs> especially the one in uh, MCO. Uh, please uh, watch your diet, otherwise you'll be very fat and overweight. Okay, the next question. Uh, hi, Dr. Tahira and Dr. C, uh, to both of you. Would the cardiac arrest protocol be similar to the protocol in adults? Can you answer that? I don't think there's any cardiac arrest yet, you know, in pediatrics. So, I mean, if there's a cardiac arrest, would you use the same cardiac arrest protocol in the adults as in the yes, adults? Yes, doctor. It will be the same. Okay. Move on. Yeah. And also for the NRP, it will be the same. It's just that uh, you have to follow certain things which I've discussed just now in terms of using the, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, self-inflating bags with the viral filters and the PAPRs if you need to uh, go to a aerosol generating procedure. So at any time, please protect yourselves and follow the uh, training that you have been given 
before you go into the uh, OT or the uh, labor room to uh, resuscitate these babies. Thank you. Okay, so in any procedures where you can, there's a high chance of aerosolization, please, you know, use the proper protective uh, garments and your, your PPE must be in place, yeah? So regardless of the situation, if it is a COVID positive patient, you have to protect, protect yourself first, yeah? Okay, this is the question from the district. In the district hospital, do we need to screen for COVID-19 for patients with clinical features suggesting bronchiolitis? Maybe Dr. Tan Kaki can uh, respond to that in the district hospital? Yeah, I think uh, under the current uh, situation, obviously uh, if the patient has features of bronchiolitis, we also know that uh, most of these wheezing episodes are more so more likely to be, I would think, non-COVID-19 than COVID-19 under the present circumstances. Uh, most will present with consolidation rather than air trapping. Uh, should you screen for COVID-19? I would say if you are quite comfortable with the clinical diagnosis of bronchiolitis, uh, probably I think the most common, most common organism will still be RSV followed by uh, para influenza, influenza virus infection. But having said so, uh, we cannot exclude the possibility of uh, community transmission, which does happen uh, across the country, we know from our data. Uh, I would like to say this would be a case-to-case -case basis. Probably we would have to discuss with the ID pediatrician before a decision is made because uh, testing kits are quite limited. Of course, it would be ideal to test those kind of babies as well. But uh, we go by the most common organisms for bronchiolitis would still be RSV. Okay, so that's the question. I mean, the commonness is still RSV, uh, but you know, it depends. If you are coming from a COVID positive area, rich spot, then I would presume that you would want to uh, screen these uh, babies with bronchiolitis yes. or with, yeah. 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 Okay, so clinical judgment is very important. If you have a high index of suspicion, this might be a COVID positive, then please do screen these patients for COVID-19. COVID okay, the next is actually for non-IT hospitals, how to handle all the BHT records written in uh, the PUI wards? Should we copy it and dispose those contaminated documents? <laughs> okay, this one is actually uh, people concerned with, you know, uh, the paper document, whether can uh, the COVID-19 virus, can SARS-CoV-2, you know, uh, survive uh, the uh, paper. Uh, maybe Dr. Tan Kaki can advise us on that. Do you think you need to, you know, uh, uh, decontaminate or sterilize the documents or what? Uh, there is an interesting uh, study from uh, US CDC and also uh, some studies from the National Center for Infectious Disease in Singapore, I think published about three weeks ago. There seem to be good clinical evidence to suggest that there is heavy contamination in the room of patients with COVID-19. I think these are already uh, proven. So obviously, uh, there is a risk of contamination of the records. So if it is a paper record, well, uh, how do you, uh, how do you uh, disinfect it? It can be quite tricky. But uh, some studies from University of Nebraska Medical Center seems to suggest that uh, ultraviolet light will be able to uh, kill the virus. Okay. So, can I, ask, can I ask uh, Sungai Bulu and, you know, uh, HTA? I mean, how do you deal with the records? Do you, uh, I, how do you handle the contamination issues on the formites and also in the wards of patients with COVID? Is there any standard operating procedures? Doctor, for, uh, since we are looking after the cases in uh, HKL, the old building, so we are using a lot of paper in BHT. So the trick is not to bring all this BHT paper inside the uh, patient area. It's all left outside. You only go in uh, with your stethoscope and nothing else with you. So everything is outside uh, the green zone, not yellow or red zone. So then your records will not be contaminated. 
Okay, that's another way. Uh, you know, don't bring your paper records into the COVID positive uh, room, you know. Leave it outside and you just bring yourself at the essential instrument. Then after you've done with your examination, then you go outside and clean yourself before you actually write on your BHT or entering data into the computer system, into the HIS. Is that the same, same for PUI? Way? Yeah, okay, or the PUI as well. Is Sungai Buloh doing the same way because you are entering data into your HIS system? Um, from Sungai Buloh, um, yes. basically we do the same thing. We do not bring anything, any notes into the dirty areas, the contaminated areas. So um, if we do need to write anything or if the patient needs to write uh, something, um, what we do is they write on a piece of paper in the room and we sort of stick it on the glass wall so the person outside will have a view of um, the notes and um, if the notes are inside the room, we dispose and destroy the notes in the room. So whatever uh, notes that are written, we run a, on a piece of paper, stick it on the glass wall, the person outside which is not contaminated, copies the notes. If you okay. need. So that's another way. So you separate those who are inside and the ones who are outside. So you can actually make sure that the, what, what the contamination is within only that restricted area. So that's another strategy. So we move on. Um, okay, the other thing is, does patient less than six years old with COVID-19 positive, who are COVID-19 positive, and then you've got the parents who are COVID negative. So the, the baby, is the, the, the child is uh, COVID positive, and both parents are COVID negative. How do you handle this patient? Who is taking care of the patient then? Because both parents are negative, but the patients are positive. How do you manage those patients in the hospital? From the first guideline doctor, we already stipulated that one guardian will look after the child, it's either the mother or the father, and they have to strictly adhere to the uh, measures, wearing masks okay. and also washing their head. So one parent is allowed. So meaning that if the one of the COVID negative parent must actually be assigned as the caregiver and stay with the baby or the child. So that's yes. actually the current guideline. Okay, thank you. Is that the same thing uh, in uh, the neonatal ward? Dr. Uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Isham, uh, so uh, the neonatal ward is different because we are totally uh, the only neonatal uh, COVID ward in the country at the moment. So it's, it's totally uh, out of bounds for the parents. Uh, but we do send them images from their phones so that the mom can have a look. So until they are clear, they can't see the uh, babies. But what we have experienced in our uh, uh, stage one and two uh, general kids ward, the case for COVID here is that from the first case that was uh, admitted here on the 25th of January, a pastor from the uh, Chinese uh, tourists from Singapore, okay. is that we get the mother to stay in. This was very unique. We have the two child, 20 months old and 11 years old, plus mother, which cannot be separated, plus the grandmother, you know, who was 65, I think, plus years old. So all four of them were in the same room because they can't be separated. Of course, the elderly uh, grandmother had to be taken care of by the mother, and the other two kids just couldn't leave the mother. So the mother initially was negative. Of course, after staying there for uh, close to two weeks, she also became positive. So despite whatever you know measures we have in place about the mask and about hand washings and everything, it's just very difficult for parents, especially when you have a child who is actually positive, but you are actually negative and you have no one to actually take care of your kids. So at any stage, uh, we have a lot of variants of these uh, arrangements. Uh, we even have uh, you know. Uh, Caucasian parents who are actually positive with one child who's uh, positive but two other childs who are negative so they all together come in the same room because who want to take care of your child if you have uh, direct contact with a positive case, isn't it? So that is the uh, uh, interesting facts about pediatric wards compared to the adult wards where you can actually isolate everyone based on their uh, condition but in pediatrics you have to uh, take care of the case by case basis and every day it's very interesting to see how the family dynamics actually play out in this uh, COVID era. Thank you. Okay, that, that's actually very sad, you know, in a sense. But, you know, you see the mother would do anything for the child. They are negative, but the child is positive. Then they would actually sacrifice. So that's why we should value our mothers. <laughs> okay, just a message, you know, in between. 
Okay, the other thing that uh, people were asking, uh, this is an anonymous uh, question. If we were to treat all Sari patients in ICU as possible COVID, does that mean we can't use non-invasive ventilation if these patients require such support? And are we supposed to intubate all patients uh, who require intubation, uh, all Sari patients? Can anyone answer that? I mean, this is, I don't know whether pediatric patients are ventilated. I mean, uh, can you give uh, at least some guidance on that? Okay. The reason why people are afraid to use NIV is because it can, might also generate aerosol. So there's a risk for healthcare worker. But saying that, we must do what is best for the patient. So if you think the child needs intubation, then go ahead. If you think the child can have an IV and there's nothing as, except for sari, no close contact with any adult uh, come positive or no history suggests that this can be a potential COVID, then we can manage the child as we manage any other child with pneumonia. At this point, the guidelines still have a criteria when you suspect uh, if somebody is COVID. So it's there in our new uh, a fifth version of the guideline. Okay, the fifth version of the guideline is available to download at the MOH website? Yes, it is. Okay, please go to the MOH web website and uh, download the guidelines which is actually freely available. Yeah, As much as possible, the guideline says that you should not use non-invasive because there is a risk of aerosolization. Uh, but, uh, you know, I mean, if you need to intubate the patient, then we, we use the invasive, the NIV, yeah? Okay, the next question, uh, I see a name there. Dr. Azila asking a question to Dr. C. Uh, Dr. C, just to re-clarify about the humidifier, do you use HME or heated humidifier ventilating the neonatal, neonatal yeah? Facility. Uh, we are in line with the adults uh, in the ICUs that we are not using any humidifiers for the uh, ventilated patients. And uh, at the moment, we are having our setup here so that uh, we are following the same thing. So we are using the HMEs, which are the heat and the moisture exchange systems, and we are using a viral filter on top of it. So uh, this is uh, uh, in contrast to the normal humidifiers we use for our neonatal ventilators. So in COVID, uh, and I see settings, you can't use that. So you have to modify your machine or you have to get machines which does not need humidifiers so that you can use the HMEs plus the viral filters. So it's just a tweak of the uh, common things that you actually do in the NICU. It's, it's quite simple. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so that's the question. Uh, the other one is a significant percentage of babies born through C-section have this transcian a tachypnea of newborn. Most of them would need CPAP for a very brief period. So this is for uh, the neonatologist. Would you intubate them or offer this group of patients CPAP? Of course, if you were to use CPAP, you will also have the humidifiers there. And at the moment, uh, it's not recommended uh, as a form of uh, support. It's actually an NIV uh, kind of a support at the moment. So. Uh, so far, we have been lucky, we don't have any, but in the case that they need and they have uh, respiratory distress, probably we will intubate them early. And uh, to uh, talk about the um, NIV thing, the, um, of course, the amount of uh, babies and also uh, pediatrics uh, that will require uh, escalation of care to uh, intubation is actually very low in uh, the Chinese cohort and also the uh, uh, studies in SARS. But uh, we extrapolate from the adult studies. What the adult found is that, is, uh, apart from that, the NIV and the HFNO, the high uh, flow nasal oxygen, is actually causing uh, aerolizations. We also found that time was wasted giving the NIV uh, in this group of patients when they should have been intubated early. And, uh, and they found that the uh, mortality rate at the end of the day is uh, almost similar when you use NIV or even uh, intubate them early. So. The, 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 Based on this, uh, most uh, intensivists now would actually intubate early rather than using NIV and uh, delaying the time from uh, uh, respiratory distress to stabilization. 
And uh, this is one of the things that uh, you know uh, is common in Sungai Bodo in the adult uh, ICU at the moment. Hopefully, we don't have many uh, pediatric patients with that, but uh, we already have a protocol in place. Should they need uh, escalation of care, we would intubate them. Thank you. Okay, so we try to actually avoid using NIV, yeah, intubate them early rather than later. Okay, the other question uh, from the College of Surgeons, yeah, I mean, regarding College of Surgeons suggesting to treat all emergency surgery as COVID-19 positive, including C-section, yeah? How can we do this in non-COVID hospital? Yeah, this is non-COVID hospital, treat all emergency surgery as covid 19 positive. Okay, hi, Can, I'm yeah. on, uh, from Sungai Bulo, uh, on behalf of ONG. So I think it would be a bit of an overkill if you're going to treat all patients actually that come in um, for any form of surgery as COVID positive. So I think what we need to actually do is again our history taking and although we have had cases which have not actually given, um, been very honest about the history in terms of contact, I think what we need to practice now is standard PPE for any patient that we are using. So I think what we could be doing is using disposable gowns and things like that when we have to do a surgery, when we are not too sure about the history of contact. But if you're going to use full PAPR and full-on PPEs for every single surgery that we do, um, in a situation where PPE is not that readily available and we're having difficulty getting it, although we have got some now, um, I think it will really be an overkill and really it's, um, we will be using resources in the wrong, um, for the wrong cases and then when we actually need it, we might actually run out of it. So I think it has to be case-to-case -case basis. We actually have to see the significance in history, um, uh, contact and things like that before we actually decide to, um, to designate whether they are a PUI or they are not and if we are quite sure that they are not, we can just proceed uh, as with any other normal patient. Okay, I go. We are clear with that. Okay, the next question: uh, All pneumonia would need COVID PCR as well, I suppose. Uh, in a sense, uh, while waiting for the COVID result, labs in small hospital uh, would stop doing all respiratory samples and blood gas. So management is difficult. So in the district, this is actually in a district hospital, and if you are going to actually treat all pneumonia as COVID positive. While waiting for the result, how would you treat the uh, samples, you know, the respiratory sample uh, and also the blood gas uh, management is difficult. I think this is some, someone from the district. So how would you address that? Maybe Dr. Tanakaki can explain how would uh, someone in the district hospital approach this? Well, whether it is... Uh under the present uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic or non-COVID-19 as previously uh, uh, we've been doing uh, all along. I think uh, standard precautions should apply to all this uh, sampling of the procedures. Uh, there shouldn't be any uh, special uh, differentiation between COVID-19 and non-COVID-19 because we wouldn't really know what it is in the first place. So I think uh, standard precautions uh, should apply. Okay, so we, we treat all uh, samples as you know a universal precaution and, and do that, yeah? Okay, this is another question to Dr. Nora. Uh, ACOG suggested to leave the vermix on the newborn for 24 hours based on expert opinion because it has antimicrobial peptides. So do you uh, recommend that to keep the vermix on the newborn for 24 hours? Uh, okay, um, the question regarding this is, again, this is an ex it is, um, expert opinion. It's not based on clear clinical evidence. Therefore, in this time and age of unsurety, we will always take the safer side for the baby. Meaning that, together with our neonatal colleagues, we follow the standard protocol. That means we still talk and tail and clean the babies. Uh, we do not leave the vermix on the newborn for 24 hours. Thank you. Okay, so this is another question to Dr. Tahera. 
uh, why was the COVID treatment given to patient one while the patient two was not given uh, COVID treatment? Can you answer that? That is the question, doctor. How? Uh, which question? Oh. Yeah, yeah, that question. Yeah. So one? many questions. Yeah. Why, Why the COVID give one and uh, and oh. while the other you don't give? Okay, that was my first case. It's also a learning, uh, learning curve, uh, learning curve for me. So now looking back, I would not treat the patient. I would have waited. Okay. So that's the answer. Uh, I'm just trying to choose the um, the system will only choose those for one patient on top. The similar one they go down, so not so many priorities. So we can maybe we can close one or two more patients. We can close. Okay, we'll see one more or two questions because you know it is rolling up. Uh, I'm not sure which one. It's not stopping. <laughs> <laughs> My eyes are getting you know <laughs> tired. Um, okay, the other one is when do you discharge COVID nineteen positive postpartum? Lady, yeah, when, when you discharge COVID-19 positive postpartum baby? When the swabs become negative. Okay, when the swab becomes negative 24 hours apart. <laughs> okay, so that's the, okay, the other one is actually uh, using an, um, does humidifier use on nasoprom cause aerosolization? So humidifier use on nasoprom, does it cause aerosolization? Of course, it does. Uh, if you're using the high flow nasal cannulas, it's same like your vapor term or your uh, humidified high flow nasal cannula that you're using already in your NICU. So, uh, if you're using just nasal prong uh, without humidification, and uh, it doesn't below, that should be okay. But if you're using humidifiers along with it, then of course, it generates aerosolization, and uh, that's not a recommended. So okay, I think I think we uh, we, we are we are yeah. we are short of time. Unfortunately, <laughs> I know. I mean, there's a lot of questions there. You know, uh, it, it is rolling up and down. Um, what is going to happen is we are going to actually collect the question and we're going to actually answer the question and put it up in the web website for for the experts to actually give the answer. And you all can actually go. Uh, to the website and and uh, and see the, the yeah, questions. We also have a summary of the discussion. Okay, and, and the organizers are also going to actually get the summary of the presentation and also the question, so that we can actually review back uh, what was being discussed uh, on uh, during this clinical update yeah, of uh, COVID nineteen. Thank the international audience. So I think I would like to thank everyone, especially those who are coming from abroad, the international audience for you know, uh, joining in the discussion. Um, we try. This is actually our third series in the clinical updates in COVID nineteen. We are doing. We are going to do it every week. Five continents. And and we have. We are seeing that there's a lot of uh, interaction uh, over five continents. What's our summary? Yeah, and and they are also looking and uh, looking uh, learning from the summary. I think that's a very positive thing coming out from this COVID nineteen because this is something very new and sometimes experience of people are you know not not well uh, you know documented and also shared i think we should actually keep on going doing this kind of uh, what exercise yeah oh dr kalai okay how are you okay i think uh, the last but not least i would like to thank all of our panel members today uh, dr nora shikin and also dr nurhana and also dr c in uh, sungai bulo stay strong Keep up the good work. We thank you. And also Dr. Tahira uh, Jamal Muhammad in uh, Hospital Tunku uh, Aziza and uh, in, in Kuala Lumpur. And also Dr. Tan Kaki, who is joining us from uh, Serembat, from Perdana University. Thank you very much for actually contributing to this very useful discussion. Uh, we hope to see you guys again next week for another se segment of our updates in COVID-19. So, Assalamualaikum and good afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Keep safe. Stay at home. Stay strong for Malaysia. Yes. Thank you. Yes.